All right, so as I said, this first notebook is about measuring resource usage and profiling some Python code, all right? Before you start doing some optimization, you first need to do when your optimization effort should be applied, all right? Otherwise you can spend tons of time optimizing something that is already quite fast or that is not very efficient, but only takes 1% of your execution time. All right, so um, first off, I start with a few uh, startup uh, uh, sales. I encourage you to do what I do, which is that is just let's run these first few cells there, okay, without reading too much into what's in there, because this cell here takes uh, a lot of time. So I will just launch it right now so that while it's running, I can come back and comment what's uh, above. All right, so just go and launch everything up till one, okay, there, and then you can scroll back up and we can see a little bit what's in there. So this first part there is just some IPython magic command so that it automatic it allows me to reload the same module or same file again and again, uh, and it does not do like a lazy load. I'll use that later on, you will see, uh, when we monitor memory. Then comes sort of the little uh, basic function we'll, which we'll play around with. Um, so for our play around function, I chose a task that is ubiquitous in data analysis, in bioinformatic, in whatever you want. And it's to compute a bunch of pairwise distance between many pods. If you think about it, uh, when you do any sort of, I don't know, any sort of um, distance-based clustering, maybe you do a k-min, or maybe you do a, maybe you do a, a hierarchical clustering, maybe you do a KNN uh, classifying, maybe you do some sort of alignment. Sometimes require that you almost always kind of rely on the concept of a distance between different points or between different samples, okay? And so it's very, very common that we have to compute all distance between all points or at least between subsets of points. And also that's a fairly, uh, let's say difficult test that can be lengthy as you gain more and more points. So this also makes it a good candidate for optimization efforts. So our function there is some base Python, all right? Uh, it accepts just a two-dimensional NumPy array, so basically a matrix of uh, of points, all right? And each point is a row, and so each point is then made of different measurements, which correspond to then the columns. We get the number of vectors, number of measurements that we have there, and then we compute a distance matrix. First, we start with just a bunch of zeros. So it's a nested list uh, with tons of zeros. Okay, at first, okay, it's, it's square in shape and it's number of vector times number of vector in size. And then we go through each vector, uh, each couple of vectors. So that's why we have two nested loops inside. And inside that, we go through all the dimension, compute the diff square difference between this dimension of this you know, single point of this, sorry, two points. And that gives us the value at uh, position ij of the distance matrix when we sum and then do the square root of this. And then we return this thing. So far, so good? Yes, you can use the reaction to let me know if everything is fine at this point. Okay, right. So that's kind of our core task and then from there we'll see if we can get farther and um, to just play around this sort of data that we'll be playing with uh, will be created that way so basically i have a number of vector 200 okay and each vector has a number of measurements 100 so then we have 200 points with 100 measurement each and so i draw them from a uniform distribution so randomly between zero and one doesn't matter too much exactly what we have at the moment, but the, the shape of the data is what matters when it comes to performance there. And so that's what we have there. Right, so the first, first, first thing that we are going to look at when it comes to monitoring time, 
we also use that when generating some data for a slightly different problem that we'll gather uh, later on. Um, and so that one for that one, I create two FASTA files. So FASTA files are text file that contains some sequence data organized such that there is one line which contains what we call a header for a sequence, and then the second line which contains the sequence and so on and so forth. All right, and so I generate two files there, one which is large with 1 million random sequence of 500 nucleotides and one uh, 500 of 500 nucleotides. They are created randomly and the content of you know this code is not really what is interesting to us. What is interesting is what comes at the top there. And so that's what we call an IPython magic command. So they are fairly specific to either IPython or Jupyter notebooks. That means that on other Python code, you will not be able to use that. And basically they come with generally two uh, flavor. Either they start with a single percent in which case they will be applied to a single line, or they come with 2%, in which case they will be applied to the whole cell. There are many built-in commands for many built-in, uh, or for many purposes, all right? The one that is of interest to us here is percent percent time. So because it's percent percent, it will be applied to the whole cell and it measures the time that it took to execute that cell. So you see here, I launched that one and now it gives me, to me the information that it took 2.23 seconds to run through, all right? And you also have slightly uh, an additional stuff. So if you go there, you have the one above and you see here this here, uh, CPU time uh, there, and you can see that it took here most of its time with the CPU and not too much time with the system that is uh, reading writing. Okay, so that's here already something that lets us monitor what how long it takes to do one cell, so basically one task if we want. All right, now. Um, this works inside uh, inside the Jupyter notebook, but then of course you're not always using that. So for this, usually we use the built-in kind of commands of your OS. We won't experiment that, but I still give you this there. Uh, so on Linux and Mac OS, it's usually the simplest. Plus you just say time and then whatever command you want. Here, for instance, python myscript.py, all right? And on the Windows, you have the measure command, and then you, you have here, you give the command that you need to benchmark. So that's when we want to just, you know, measure a whole script at once. Okay, so that can be useful, but oftentimes it's a bit too coarse grained for what we want to do. And that's why sometimes it's just useful to take your code and then cut it in smaller pieces and maybe put it in a Jupyter notebook or do some experiments in the Jupyter notebook between different to test different function or different implementations and so on and so forth, such as we do here. So for example, you have our compute pairwise distance with our basic data. And when we use person time, we can just measure the time that it takes to execute this single line, right? And we can contrast that with what I've just shown you above, which person person time will apply to the whole cell, irrespective of the number of comments that we have there. All right, we can see that there, it's relatively similar, okay? But there is some difference, which is maybe on the order of 5% or so. So it's something that is not, also not entirely negligible. And this also depends on the amount of data that you have to go through on the time that it takes to uh, to run the command. Basically, the faster the command, the larger the uncertainty that you have on your measure. We can see that if we just run it on a smaller subset of data, so one, only 100 points with 10 measurements each, you see that now it takes only 110 milliseconds, but then 
you see that now the variation is more on the order of 10 to 20 percent you see i can go from 110 to 85 milliseconds so which is which which one should we take into account and also like when we compare to implementation we should make sure that we sort of take into account this uncertainty there and so that's why we go farther than just the time command but we use the time it module which tries to solve that so you can either use it as the python module so if you just launch a python command such using this uh, syntax or you have the time it magic command so there you have person time it or person person time it and you have a number of options so the idea is that it will execute a line of code many times okay and then report the result so if we just execute the default one it will look like this you see that now it takes much longer to run and what it says is that it takes 80.7 milliseconds more or less four milliseconds per loop with a seven run of 10 loop each okay so what it has done there is that it says okay there is some inherent variation when we run and so it will run uh ta -ta -ta, yeah it will run here but batches of 10 execution and takes the best out of 10 and then it will repeat that seven time and report then the best out of 10 seven times to compute a mean and standard deviation for you so that's why we get this result here and then you can manually specify the number of repeat and loop performed because if you just let it run its normal stuff what it does is that if the fast the sorry yeah the faster the command that you try to execute the more loops and run it will do it will try to adapt it so that they you always keep the same sort of level of uh of of precision in the report but then sometimes if you want to measure something that is very fast it will do so many 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 repeat that it will actually take a very long time uh, to um, to do the measurement and i mean it's nice but sometimes we want to do some quick check it's a bit faster to just do some manual uh, setting of the number of repeat that you want to do because then it will take uh, less time okay you get less less coarse grain uh, less fine grain precision but you know for quick checks often it's useful also very often you'll see that the sort of performance in gain that we want to get are not on the order of 10 percent what we want to aim for is more like a speed of, of two times three times ten times one hundred times okay and so at this level it's no use to have all of this precision all right so then that's how we do that with dash n and dash r so let's see there what we have as a report okay you see that now it runs much faster and that we have more uncertainty uh, and we have now done 10 runs of two loops each there is n and r okay now i have a little question for you why should we take then the best out of our loops okay why not the mean at this case please write in the chat if you have ideas why or if you think that this is a bad idea and that we should not do that okay so from Jörg we propose that longer times are probably caused by background operation on the OS yes you say that maybe it's because Python might be caching our function um so I would say that yeah it's mostly uh Jörg's answer uh so the idea is that on your OS, there are sometimes other stuff happening. And so if you monitor a, fun a function, but there is a background process that is also getting executed at the same time, and this artificially slows down your function, uh, 
And then that, that is sort of noise, if you will, that you would like to avoid. And that's why we want to then run it several times to then get the best, okay? So that we get out of this sort of noise. And so then this best is of course repeated in order to gain an idea of the variation around it, but that is the main reason. Okay. All right, so now we are, thanks to this, able to compare different implementation of our function. So for that, I will then uh, repeat the implementation that we have had before. Okay, so that is the pure basic Python version of the function. And I did the same thing, but using NumPy functions. So NumPy is numeric Python. It's a library that implements uh, tons of uh, operations on vectors, operation on matrices, uh, so vectorized operation, and is supposed to be much faster than native Python when it comes to these very numerical tasks. So let's put that to the test. Um, so my number of vector and measurement is gotten there. Then I create an empty NumPy matrix first, which I will populate. And then I still have my double loop there. This hasn't changed. But now inside that, instead of going through each measurement kind of with a for loop, I just vectorize the operation of doing the point I minus the point J. And so I do the two there, then I square each element and then I sum and compute the square root of everything. And I do all of that with NumPy functions and populate my matrix. So now, if we compare these two implementation using a 100 by 100 matrix of random value as input, we will see how long it takes. So the native Python takes a bit of time, okay? So here you see it takes 700 milliseconds, more or less 13 seconds, whereas uh, NumPy takes 78 milliseconds, more or less 3 milliseconds. So we have a speed up there on the order of about mm, maybe eight or nine, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, and uh, so you see also that all the fine grainness that we might get by having a large number of runs and loops is not 100% necessary uh, there because we are looking for, at least at first, we are looking for super large speed up. When we then maybe later on start having a uh, very efficient uh, code and we are aiming for a smaller reduction because we have already like done most of what we can, then we will go for the fine grain precision, right? When we just try and grab like a few milliseconds here and there. But at first you don't need that at least most of the time. Okay. Um, is there any questions so far? Is everything still making sense? Yes. All good. All right. Is the NumPy implementation there also making sense for everyone? I know that not all of you might be uh, extremely familiar with NumPy itself. And so maybe you don't necessarily know all of these functions, but the concept of it is okay for everyone. Okay, right. Otherwise, don't hesitate to ask me to repeat or something. Um, then, one thing that can be useful uh, also is because there you see that I do that and then I show it on the screen. Okay, that's super nice. But then sometimes if you want to compare tons of implementation, it's useful to keep this in a variable. So this is achieved with option dash O to the time it command. And then you can grab everything in an object, which I call here time it res. And so we can have a little look at it because then it contains all of the uh, Sorry, that's not why I'm take two time it res. Yeah. So then you have a time it result. You see that it contains all of the result that you wanted. And typically what you want to access is you can access the 
average there, but you can also access precisely how long it took for each run to play and so on and so forth. Um, now, there is a question by Kion He asking, is that true uh, that modules always run quicker than basic Python? That is not true. Uh, some modules have been built explicitly to be super fast, and in which case, in general, they will be faster than basic Python. But plenty of modules just reuse some basic Python, and so they are not faster. And also, some modules have been developed by people who did not care too much about performance, and sometimes they even perform worse than basic Python because they did not always use the most uh, appropriate function or built-in function uh, when they were developing their module. Okay, so that's not a general rule. With that being said, a lot of uh, modules that are thought with performance in mind, I'm thinking about NumPy, about SciPy, about maybe sklearn as well, are in general quite fast and um, you can you can create functions that are faster than what they do and what they propose, but it requires a little bit of legwork. But you'll see uh, this afternoon that we actually can do something that is faster. All right. Um, all right, so then we have our time it res object. So that's nice because then we don't only show something to the screen, but we can then play around with this data and monitor it and so on and so forth. So for example, one application that I propose is when we investigate, not just compare like two implementation and see how long they take, but then see how the time, the execution time changes with the size of the problem that we provide. So for example, we try to see how the execution time evolves with the data size there. So I test different uh, number of vector size. Okay, so I apply the function to bigger and bigger uh, data sets. So here a little for loop, and then I create the data. I grab the result here, and then I add the timings there to a um, to a little uh, list here. Okay, so let's execute to that. It will take a few seconds. Um, and then time it res is, so there's a question by Elisa asking what type is time it res. So time it res is a sort of a custom time it result type, if you will. So it's, uh, it's, it contains as attributes all of the sort of elements. So it's got the average, the standard deviation and so on and so forth. So if we look at it, you see it's this time it result type. And then in there, there is the runs of the average, the best, the comp the time that it took just to do the compilation of the little function, the loop, and so on and so forth. Right. Does that answer your question? Oops. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. So here you see that it took a bit of time to uh to create, but now we have this uh we have kept all the timings uh across all of the different uh problem size and so now we can actually plot them in order to show them and that is what we see so you have here the number of vector and then the evolution of the execution time there and you can see that the shape is not fully straight and now a little question to you what do you think about the shape of this curve was this do you think expected and so on and so forth so Take a little bit of time to think about it. And then please write what you think in the chat.
So um, so you, you wrote both basically that you expect the time to indeed, ah, there's this as well. So that you expect the time to grow according, well, there's a little bit of confusion there, but you expect the time to grow according to a squared of the number of vector. I want to dispel a little bit of confusion there because two people mentioned uh, an exponential growth. Uh, this is not an exponential growth. An exponential growth is something that would grow uh, that would grow something with um, x to the power of uh, let me see I have some. x to the power of n would be an exponential growth. All right. What we see here is an n to the power squared. So that's a sub exponential growth, and that's a square growth. It's just a point of uh, it's just a point of let's say maybe vocabulary, but I think that as you know, as scientists, it's important that we see this uh, difference, right? Uh, because a square growth is much more controllable than an exponential growth, which will grow much, 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 much faster, all right? And so when we think about our, um, our computational problem, it's very important that we keep uh, this sort of difference in mind. Okay, so as you see, as you've seen, indeed, the uh, the growth here is not linear. It tends to be bigger as um, as the problem grows, and in particular, there, the um, the the time will evolve with the square of the number of vectors that we have. The reason why is if we look at the code fairly easy to get is that we have two loops. We have nested loop inside one another. So for i in range, oh, sorry. Okay, num of vector. And then inside this loop, there is a for j. And then inside that we do something. Okay, so then that's why you know we have to go from each of the number of vectors. So we do an operation and time and then for each of these operation we go again through all of this so for each n we need to go for each n so we do m times n operations hence they're the squared right is it clear to everyone why we have this square growth then okay so let's spend just a little bit of time on that i think that most of you already have the ideas but in place, but it's nice to put in place just the concepts uh, because that's also something that you will see written here and there. So the complexity of an algorithm, uh, here we are going to talk specifically about the time complexity of an algorithm, is basically what we just did, is to say, given the number of the parameters of our, of my, um, of my, of my algorithm, I want to describe how the how long it takes you know uh, as a function of these parameters with very broad strokes okay i don't care exactly about the precise measurement but mostly about the broad stroke or how of how it going is going to play with so for example if we take our um our algorithm there it depends if there is two for loop one on the number of vector a second on the number of vector and then all of the operation that we do they also depend on the number of dimension right because then we do an operation that will be uh if you remember here the numpy function we do here a subtraction against two vectors each vector is of size number of measurements so we need to subtract all of these numbers right or in the native Python, we have a for loop in the number of measurements as well. So both of these operations here, this one and that one, of course, in practice, they won't take the same amount of time, but they are both dependent on the number of measurements in there. Is that clear to everyone? Okay. So now if we then write 
our our function again okay it then we it's like if we have irrespective of the two implementation that we have seen so far a third loop that depends on the number of measurements okay and if we call this number of measurements m we now have our our, oh, our our general code that depends on something that is n times n times m okay now of course we have seen together that the numpy implementation is about 10 times faster than the basic na uh, native python implementation but both have what we would call the same complexity which is usually noted with a big o all right of n times n times m all right so in basically what we say is that if we like for both implementation if we double the number of vectors we will multiply by about four the time ex that it takes to go through that and if we double the number of measurement we will double the time that it takes to again do the execution right so this lets us also have like an additional complexity uh to 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 add there when we think about the optimization is that sometimes it's not necessarily only about the time that it takes to do a specific task but also to how a specific implementation or a specific algorithm will see its execution time evolve when the problem changes right that is something very important to keep in mind because most of the time we do our little testing there on smaller data sets and so being aware of the um being aware of the time complexity lets us make better prediction for when it comes to applying that on our real data set okay this is also what lets you know if like okay on your test data set it takes one hour then knowing the complexity you can know if with the real data it will take four hours or four days or three weeks or 500 years okay and so it, it pays some time to just draw this little line and think about the sort of code that you use here during this course we are not going to go delve super deep into the algorithmics uh but um, sometimes when finding, trying to find a alternative solution for the same problems, it can be interesting to delve on that because if you are able to reduce the complexity of a problem, for example, when it comes to this n square problem, very often there are tricks to rewrite them as log n times in log n times n complexity. I'm thinking, for example, about the algorithm that we can use to sort uh, some data, for example, that's a common, let's say, algorithmic exercise. You will obtain not only something that is faster for the same size, but also something where the this difference between the two implementation will become bigger as the size of the problem increases and so suddenly you can you have problems which were not possible or not tractable before that becomes tractable as i said we won't see too much example of that in there because it's mostly about algorithmic course and not coding course we will see here let's say programmation tricks to make the same code go faster but that's still something that is interesting to keep in mind sometimes uh, when you do your when you when you go and see at your code see if there is not like a nested loop that is not really useful some computation that you do several times for no reason stuff like that all right any questions so far on what we've seen and on this little blurb about complexity no everything okay cool right so then let's continue a little bit all right so um sometimes so we have seen together how we can time a whole cell or a single line but sometimes you have bits of code that will intermesh different operations typically 
take here our uh, large FASTA file there, and let's say we want to read it, okay? And we want to compute the GC percent uh, for each FASTA line. So the GC percent is basically, you've got some, um, some sequence of DNA, it's made of ATGC, CCGTA, okay, something like this. And the GC percent is just what is the percentages of, of G and C among that. Um, and so what we do there, you see, if I open the file, and for each line in the file, if the line doesn't start with this little uh, chevron symbol, which, sing, uh, which specifies that what follows is a sequence ID and not a sequence. So if it's not that, that means that I have a sequence. So I count the number of C's, a number of G's. I multiply by 100 and divide by the length of the line and I get my GC percent. And it takes me about four seconds, 4.5 seconds there. But you could ask yourself, okay, but there is two operations there intermeshed. There is reading a file and there is computing a GC percent. And so it would be legitimate to ask, well, what time does it take to do this part and that part? So of course you could kind of refactor your code maybe to split uh, these two operations in two, in two separate steps. But also this would maybe and very likely force you to store all the sequence in your RAM uh, in the in form of a list or something like that. And so if your file is very, very large, that might not be really super nice and sometimes not even feasible if the file is really too large. So for this, we need another trick. And there, the one that we use is very, very classical. Uh, we use the time module, in particular, the time dot time function. So the time function of the time module. So I import time and then I call the function time dot time. Then what it gives me is a very large number there. And that is the number of second that has um, elapsed since the what we call the epoch. So that is the 1st January 1970, which is sort of the accepted, uh, let's say, start time for all the machines. All right. And you can see that it returns it with a certain degree of granularity as well. So now what we do is that we keep a start time, okay, in epoch, and then we compare it with the stop time or with the end time again in epoch. And with the difference, we know how long, like how much time has passed, if you will. So applied to our code looks like this, okay. I start, you know, to you know, I know what time it was when I started uh, entering that code. And then I have the time that it took after, all right? So by doing the difference between the stop and the start, I know the total time that was elapsed to run all of these bits of code. And now on top of that, inside the loop, I can just take the here start time just before the count of GC and then this just after, and then I keep that in a running sum, okay? Such that each time I get in there, I compute the time that it took to compute the GC. So I can sum them up together to get the total time that it took to compute all of the GCs across all of the lines, okay? But without counting the reading part. And so then I can fairly easily get the total time GC, the time it took just to compute the GC. And by doing the difference, I know exactly how long it took to do the actual reading of the file, all right? So now there we go. It took five seconds to do the total, about four seconds to, so 3.8 seconds to compute the GC percent, and about 1.2 seconds to just read the file. So we have also a small idea about what operation cost exactly what. And we also know a little bit what we could do. For instance, if we know that if we made the GC percent function perform uh, instantaneously, the code would still take 1.2 seconds to read, uh, to, to go through. Right. 